Vietnam was the first television war, and every day the American people back at home saw on their TV screens the sickening reality of the bloodshed. Uh, US troops were dying at the rate of four to 500 a week at the time of the Tet Offensive. Um, and as the body bags came home, the anti-war movement grew in strength um, and ever stronger. Um, so from Tet onwards, US policy turned to getting out of Vietnam, salvaging as much honor as possible. The war finally ended with a communist victory and America's defeat seven years later. And Tet and the Battle of Bray was really the tipping point. Don, who you all know, now of course, um, photographed the Battle of Hue, uh, and you've seen his slides being shown here, and they're very, very powerful. No disagreement about that, but one picture stands out, which is this one of the shell shot Marie. Um, Anthony uh, was one year old at that time. Um, I don't want to be rude by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but in due course, uh, like a lot of us, I think the Vietnam War caught his imagination. Um, indeed, I think I'm right, Anton, saying that one of the things that drove you to become a war correspondent uh, was actually the war photography of Don and the other great photographers in Vietnam. Indeed. I was fascinated by it. I think in my early teens, way back in my earliest memories, I just about had the memories of, of, of the closing stages of the war on TV, principally just of, of bombs dropping out of Bombay. So that was about all I could remember from that stage. By my early teens, I became fascinated particularly by the writings of uh, people like Michael Hurd's Dispatches, uh, Mark Baker's great book, Nam, and by the work of the photographers too, uh, Kyochi Sawada, uh, Larry Burroughs, Jens Griffiths, and, and Don too. Um, and it suggested to me that there was a profession that would be very interesting and uh, at times great fun to be involved with, which was journalism. But the war itself fascinated me because it seemed so wild art. It seemed not only war, but it seemed the 60s, it was rock and roll, it was sex and drugs too, from the American perspective. And it seemed very much that, as, as one of the critics of Michael Hare wrote, you know, Jimi Hendrix gone to hell with a pocket full of pills, you know. It was it was it looked like it looked like a hell of a war. But one thing that stood out to me amongst the photographs um, was John's set of photographs. And there are a set from the Battle of Quay, which is John has described as this fulcrum point battle. And these these photographs, they are a set. They show a, quite a small unit, uh, a particular company, D, D Company, Delta Company, the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines, in action in this intense urban battlefield. And most of the pictures, to me, actually look quite glorious. They are Olympian. They are of soldiers at the peak of their combat experience, wrestling with their fears, their courage, the men hurling Marines, <laughs> holding their wounded bodies, trying not to grimace as they're, they're held up in pain. Those I don't find so interesting. Overall, the set is incredible. It shows the face of battle and a photographer's place at that face. But the guy that really gets me is this guy. In terms of structure, it's not as interesting a photograph as the others. It's, it's just a straight out portrait. But this guy occupies the place in the pantheon, probably the worst fears of, of the male, particularly the inability to carry on in combat. He's not the guy hurling the grenade or holding his wounded buddy or trying to drag himself out of a firefight. He's the guy who couldn't go on. And worse than that, at his moment of personal horror, a photographer turns up and takes his picture. Even worse than that, that photographer is Don McCullough. And in a short space of time, this man's moment of extreme horror becomes one of the iconic images of war in the 20th century. So this guy is very important because unlike, to me, the other images, showing, to me at least, suggesting a glory in war, there is no glory here for this man. There is this desperate, raw vulnerability and paralysis. And I always wanted to know, well, 
who was he? I was speaking to Don earlier, and the question which most people ask him in his work about Vietnam is, hey, who was the shell shock marine, and what became of him? So it's sort of haunted me down the years. The 50th anniversary of the battle was coming up. For the past couple of years, I've been having these conversations with Don. And then I decided, well, this is a, a simple idea. Maybe I'll find him, and that's, that's how it started. This is why this guy drew me, and he's a mystery. Do you, you ever come across anyone else who was looking for a material? No. No. <laughs> no. 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 Yeah. And I came across many other people who thought they were in other uh, photographs of Don's or might have been or might not have been, or people I identified as definitely being, but I never met anybody who wants to be him. I think you said to me at the time, which was very interesting, because you said it's, it's anyone who's been in combat, it's uh, some sort of worst fears of letting it all go, just losing it. Um, and um, yet we don't know the story behind what Baker might have done. As you said to me, I think we were talking about this. You know, it could have been really fierce combat. He might have blown away a child. It might have been. He might have just killed a kid. Yes. He might have killed a kid. He might have killed someone in his fire team by accident. Yeah, accident. So no. Yeah. But and along the way. I came in contact with a lot of people who had been in contact with him. So, I mean, in short, I started with, with Don and one name. So I spoke to, to Don a lot about his work, uh, about this set, and about his time with, with Delta Company. And Don was still in contact with one person, Myron Harrington, now a uh, retired colonel, but at the time he was Captain Harrington, who was the commander of Delta Company. And Don had his email address. So I wrote to Myron. Said, "Names Android. I'm really interested in identifying Marines in a set of photographs taken by John McCullough when he was with you, and in particular, this guy. Of course, I was interested in the other photographs because I thought there might be someone in the other photographs who would say, "Hey, and this guy happened to be and give me a name." So that's how it started with Don, and then one name. And what happened next was that um, Myron Harrington was extremely helpful. I, was so, I suppose I was always slightly nervous thinking, why I'm, I'm a Brit, I was one year old in Quay. Um, is how interested are they going to be in talking about it? I mean, some of them it's really, some of them are sort of really wigged out and they're really angry and don't want to talk about it. Some of them are angry and do want to talk about it. Some are, are open. But also, as well, listen, I'm, where's my currency here? I mean, it's not like I'm Don and I was there in the battle with them. I'm someone who was, you know, a baby at the time. How are they going to be? But in fact, more rather than less, wanted to speak to me. And it didn't matter that I was not Don, because there were two or three who were very aware of Don. Byron Harrington was uh, regarded with huge warmth. Some of the other guys, some of the other grunts were like, well, I didn't even know I had my picture taken, I was fighting. Like, you know, they hadn't seen, it wasn't the internet age. They did that tour, they went home, they weren't in connection with anyone else in their unit. They had, they're not of the uh, strata of society who would be looking online when the internet did kick in, like 30 years later, to look at photographs of, uh, of, of dons and identify themselves. Some of them hadn't seen the photographs until I, I sent them over. Little by little, uh, one name leads to another, and then I had to go through uh, the National Archives where they had their unit diaries, which were on microfilm. So finally I found the microfilm <coughs> of Delta Company, and which gives you a daily breakdown of, uh, of, of who is, what happened and who was evacuated each day. And at that point it came to me in a shoebox and I was like, hey, I'm going to solve this by lunchtime and siesta. And I saw there were like 800,000 cereals on the <laughs> Um I'll go on to, to yeah. talk about what happened next more. Shall we uh, just show us? Before you show this, this, this film, um, can I just, I just want to read a little passage about the Battle of Huey. It's, it's only a few paragraphs long, written by David Greenway of Time Life magazine, who was with Delta Company as a journalist um, over that period, and himself was wounded and ended up getting on the wrong staff for rescue the Marine. Um, and so it just, it just gives an image, I mean, a, a verbal image of 
of, of, of the fighting. So I'll just do that quickly. <coughs> the North Vietnamese captured Hue as part of the Tet Offensive, a countrywide attack on, on American and South Vietnamese positions that began at the end of January and lasted in some places for weeks. In Hue, they occupied the citadel with its Chinese style palace, which was built in the early 19th century to house Vietnam's emperors. With its surrounding moat, high walls, and stone towers, the citadel provided ideal defensive positions. He says, I was embedded with Delta Company of the 1st Battalion for three years, nicknamed Dying Delta, which is which is the, the unit that I'm talking about, because of its high cavalry <coughs> rate. On the day I shot some photographs, they were advancing south along the eastern wall of the citadel, under fire, from hidden positions. Civilians who had been hiding in their homes would appear from time to time and dash down the street, hoping to escape the battle zone. Sometimes they made it, sometimes they didn't. The streets smelled of cordite, burning houses and dead bodies, all under a cold, dark sky and a misty drizzle that French soldiers in the previous war had called crashan or spit. Along the walls ahead of us loomed a stone edifice, the Dong Ba Ta, that had been reduced to rubble by artillery, airstrikes, even gunfire from ships at off the Vietnamese coast. Still a few North Vietnamese remained alive and dangerous in the rubble. It took the Marines several days to reach the wall and enter the citadel, but the combat didn't end. The communists refused to retreat or surrender, which meant that the Marines and South Vietnamese had to clear the city block by block, driving up the casualties on both sides, and among them the many civilians unable to flee. During lulls in the fighting, the Marines would shelter in abandoned houses, eat their combat rations, even shave in broken mirrors. Marines had never seen urban fighting like this, and they wouldn't again until the Battle of Fallujah, almost 40 years later. That's just a try and capture a bit of the atmosphere. As John said at the beginning, the actual week of, I think, the 11th to the 17th of February, during which most of this fighting happened, which, which incorporated half the time Don was there, was the worst week of all for the American experience in Vietnam. They suffered. Uh, 550 dead that week alone, two and a half thousand wounded in the course of that week. And 68 was the worst year for them. They had 16 and a half thousand deaths, American deaths in Vietnam. And I came very, very close, very, very close to him, uh, as I will go on to describe. But I think what I learned from the others, it was very interesting. Each conversation certainly didn't end as I'd anticipated. <laughs> Usually there's the bit of sort of floundering around. Uh, when talking to these guys. I had to do a couple of wham bams in hotel rooms which weren't very satisfying, but, but others I spoke to some over weeks and months, uh, and a couple I've spent you know, two or three days with. Um, and it, but most I spent a lot of time with on the phone over a long time preceding before meeting them. And um, one of the first things I learned, or that honed in awareness I had, is, is to do with trauma. I think uh, trauma, particularly PTSD, is a word that's very overused and very uh, inappropriately used in terms of, of war. Um, and I think that is complicates the position of those who are affected by severe trauma. To my mind, it's become quite, quite, quite faddish. And I know that's uh, slightly, that's slightly counterintuitive, but. What I did learn from these guys was the context of cultural trauma. And people experience in war trauma in different ways, according to a great extent, to their culture. For example, after the Bosnian War, Bosnia's got the most appalling rates of PTSD. There was no greater good really served by that war. They're very confused as to their definitions of enemies because they used to live together as one as part of Yugoslavia. And they all fell apart, there was, no, there was no clear winner. And they're all very messed up by the war. Whereas if you look at Palestinians, Palestinians historically have got one of the lowest rates of PTSD because despite their suffering, they have quite coherent interpretation of, of what an enemy is or, or what their own survival should be based on. In terms of these guys, PTSD was the rate of PTSD was huge for a number of reasons. First of all, America lost them. And if you've been fighting and suffering, particularly in another land, and then you lose the war, you spend a lot more time thinking, well, what was that all about? And the second thing was the context to which these guys had come back to. You know, this was the height of the anti-war movement, 68. They came back. By the nature of the unit formation and their tour of duty, they came back alone. 
into the most rabid anti-war sentiment was spat at, you know, got into fights, isolated, abused. It was a bad, bad place to be, a returning veteran. So you were coming back from a losing war, it was ultimately lost, into and isolated in your own society. So left them feeling very, very angry, the war memories really curdling within them. And um, that is why it is still so prevalent, the, the, the aftershocks of trauma among so many of these guys, I mean most of these guys, I suppose, it varied, but almost everybody, even Myron Harrington, who was the most straight up southern officer, Myron would probably still be fighting the war if it was left down to him, you know what I mean? But even he, you could just about get into the issue of trauma with, but all the others, as you saw that, Selwyn Tate, I mean Selwyn Tate's life, he was the uh, Afro-American thrown grenade. Arguably throwing grenades, certainly in the second photograph there, there's some debate about the grenade photo. He uh, joined the Marines to escape a custodial sentence at age 16. <coughs> he was fighting in Kuwait at age 17. Um, and he was back in America fighting with anti war protesters alone aged 18. Four marriages and eight children later, he still goes to his uh, you know, shrink sessions wondering what the fuck is all about. What was very interesting with him was I sat in the room with his two sons, or two or two of his sons. We had this big conversation, which was quite limited, because he couldn't remember most of the battle. He had been through such a peak experience in, in the Babylon day three that he couldn't remember anything after that at all. He appears in some of Don's photographs and some other people's photographs, but he can't remember anything about it. So it was, the interview wasn't getting very far. And then I flicked it around to one of his sons. I said, hey, What's it like for you sitting in the room listening to your dad talk like this? And this son took a huge breath and was like, I'm so pleased you asked that question. We were raised in the shadow of his war trauma, the echoes of Quay, rolled throughout our childhood and upbringing, domestic violence, it's drunkenness, abuse, discord. Uh, and it was all quite confessional, obviously, into a lot of uh, you know, sessions to try and work it out. It wasn't like he was revealing something his dad was going to be surprised at. But there was suddenly this, this great aftershock years and years later being played out from that battle. There were moments Anne, when you became so personal and you actually switched your tape recorder um, I think you a piece of, you know, which is, you know, it's that, that experience um, of approaching someone who's gone through that sort of trauma and which, you know, or familiar with the cover copy. Um, and, um, and just knowing when is the right moment to answer the problem, that sort of question, switch, switch the table. I mean, you, 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 you felt very, you know, you had hesitation at the same time. You, had, um, you felt qualified to, which is to actually pose those questions and go there deeper than I think that, that lots of people would have done unless it was their shrink actually sort of going through what had happened. But also talking to them uh, as, um, as as a, as a as a war correspondent, you know, you're having your own experiences of war. Um, you just there was a certain camaraderie, I suspect. That was, I mean, I find um, whoever one interviews as a journalist, one has to have established a relationship with, whether it's a transient relationship of a few minutes or an hour or whether they don't like you, or whether they resent you, you have to establish something. This was very different to get men to talk about stuff that happened 50 years ago. You had to really take time with it. Um, and sometimes, as I say, like most interviews, it starts off in a slightly wooden fashion. You sort of find each other's middle ground, and, and, and then suddenly, often without warning, I mean, there's one guy, Frenchy Bourgeois, he's the guy who is in the photographs of Don's caption, Cruc Crucifixion. He's been held, he's been uh, shot through the groin, actually. And he was probably the most resolved of the individuals that I spoke to. Delightful man, I spent two or three days with him. And um, he had mentioned the name of his platoon commander, a really interesting guy called Jack Inler, who was killed a few months later. A lot of these guys survived Huey, and but didn't survive yet now. Um, we'll, we'll kill later. And so, French had been telling me about how he felt Vietnam had not defined him. He loved being a Marine, he'd stayed in the court in 72. 
And he said something very cool. He said, I'm okay with my past. And he had this fantastic delivery. And he was a, he was a kind of, not just a cool guy, but kind of really impressive. And then I suddenly said to him, hey, what happened to Jack Ibler? And oh my God, it was like a freight train just came through the walls. He said, I can't talk about that. And just burst into tears like that. Uh, and completely lost it from this moment of being so composed, so self-possessed. Uh, at other times, God, there was one guy I spoke to who, who I didn't write about. He was very helpful to me, very, very helpful in, in, in putting this together. He described to me one night very bad visibility. He was with a very small group of Marines in a very exposed position. And he suddenly said, I could hear them coming. I could hear the NBA coming. They all, they, no one talked about the NBA as gooks or yellow man or anything like that. They talked about the NBA, they talked about the North Vietnamese Army, and they were full of respect for he said it was night, I had a few guys, and I could hear them coming. I could hear them coming towards us across the rubble. And this, this Marine's a big Marine, big, tough guy in his day. And he said suddenly, before I knew it, one of them jumped up over a wall and was on me. And he said, I thought they were supposed to be little. I dropped my M16. He said, I ended up going hand to hand with the only bodybuilder in the North Vietnamese <laughs> Army. And he said, what a, you know, Jesus, I didn't have my rifle, but it was too close. The NBA guy dropped his 40, AK-47, so they were rampaging around, grabbing each other's throats, trying to pummel each other uh, on the rubble in the cold of dark, unable to scream because he didn't want more people from the you know, NBA to come and kill him. And he said, finally, I managed to hold him down, I got my K-bar and I thought, and then I'm like, well, hang on, where the fuck are you supposed to stab them? So he said, I started lunging away at his face, it was ricocheting off his cheekbones. So he said, I was just slashing his face up. And I'm telling you, because this is what he told me. This is the, the level of, of what they go back into. And he said, finally, I managed to jam it through his eye and hold him as he shut it out. And then he said, and I heard another one coming. And all I noticed was the guy just killed stunk of fish sauce, because that's what they put on their rice. And he'd been sweating so much that he was smelling a fish sauce. And he did say, presumably, I was stunk of tobacco, because he was chewing his tobacco. And he said, so I was trying to get the knife out, but then I noticed you can't get it out of his head, it was stuck. So I had to pick up a piece of broken weapon, and that's what I killed the next guy with. So, yeah, I got pretty, and then he said, uh, it, was, it was in a deep conversation. And then he said, I'd really prefer it if you didn't write about that as my experience, because I don't think people would understand. So I didn't write about it as his experience, I didn't mention it at all. But that was, it could be extreme grief. It could be the recollection of something as intimate as that, which is almost sort of psychosexual. Or something completely different. It could be a son in a room saying something. It was, I felt, I did feel qualified to deal with it. And had I found this guy, I would have felt, I would have given it my best shot to give him, get him to talk leaving the option to him. Yes. But you didn't find him. You came quite close. I came very close. So I, I had one big breakthrough. Key thing, scrubbing around in the archives, was to find out what date that photo was taken. Because I'd spoken to Dawn, I'd spoken to the company commander, Myron Harrington, who remembers him well, this, this case. And he was evacuated on this day. Now how to find out which day? As soon as I find that day, I can go through the records in the archives and find out which guys were evacuated from Delta on that day. Then I can do it by a process of elimination. Dawn remembers that he was in the company of the, uh, he was being uh, spoken to by the gunnery sergeant of Delta. And that minutes later a rocket came in and wounded the gunnery sergeant and several other guys. That was a breakthrough detail because each company's only got one gunnery sergeant. So then I could go to the archives and I found the gunnery sergeant, whose name was Odell Stobel. Now Odell Stobel was an interesting guy. He joined the Corps when he was 16 in, in uh, the Second World War, fought in the Pacific as a teenage Marine, then fought in Korea. And by the time he got to Vietnam, he'd been wounded a lot. Uh, I was, was quite a veteran. So he's the last known guy to see this man. Then a rocket comes in, wounds the gunnery sergeant, he's evacuated. So I find the gunnery sergeant, find out what day he was evacuated, which is the 21st. February 1968, and find out where the rocket hit and wounded a lot of people there, which was did, uh, timed in the unit down at 7.45 in the morning. So this photograph was taken in the morning, 
the 21st of February. So I looked then, and who else was evacuated that day? And that gave me seven names. I found four of them, which was pretty good going. Um, but unfortunately, what I hadn't counted on was the records were a mess. All the four I found had been physically wounded. There wasn't any record of anybody who had been evacuated for shell shock, if you want to call it that, it's some kind of mental paralysis. Um, and also, the records were a mess anyway. I mean, I got, I finally found the company Clark in California, a guy called Gary, and I said, Gary, it's all over the place. And he's like, hey man, half the time I had to fight, and then I was just trying to, you know, catch up with the amount of dead and wounded. I had to put in files, and I was just, I didn't all go well. Um, so, it didn't go well. The paperwork was all over the place. I came very, very close. And, in fact, this is probably a, a good moment to uh, play the audio. One guy I spent a lot of time speaking to was a guy called um, Star Sergeant Robert Toms in Alaska. And Robert Toms was one of those sort of warrior marines who had gone into some sort of state of combat overdrive during the battle. He was wounded three times. If you're wounded three times, you're entitled to leave Vietnam. But he was wounded in about three times in about the first 48 hours and continued fighting and then was wounded a fourth time. Uh, within a few days, most of his clothes had been blown off him, so he was wearing a dead North Vietnamese army soldier's shirt uh, and some other dead guy's trousers. Um, he was a very belligerent, very, very cool guy to speak to. I sent him a photograph of that Marine, probably about nine months ago now. And then he came back, can we have the audio? and uh, spoke to me over the phone. When he talks about a corpsman, he means a, a medic. This is what he says, and this is as, as close as I could get. I sent two guys next door to recon their family. They told me they recon their family and they were the only guy that came back from the dark. And I said, where's the other guy? He said, he's not back yet? He said, I had it upstairs. He said, he was, he was checking the down here. I said, oh, fuck. You know, there's, of course there's no light to tomorrow in some cases, and there's really no hand yet right here. <coughs> so we, I grabbed the guy, maybe two, I, I don't really remember. I know I had at least one guy, maybe two. And I'm going over because this is, this is really dangerous and I'm not going to send, you know, two kids over there without any supervision. But I figured this, something has happened to this guy. It's a setup somehow. So, one guy goes through the window first. I sent him upstairs. The other guy I sent to watch. I had him just stand by the wall inside the house and watch my bed. Well, I didn't get ambushed. And I started going around the walls, and I spotted something white in the front room, in the corner. And I realized it was a face. It was a, just a glint of something light colored. And I went over, and this was a Marine, just kind of sitting against the wall with his eyes open. His helmet on. First, I felt for a pulse in his wrist. We can get a pulse in the wrist, so I felt his carotid artery, and I got a pulse. I could feel it. He had a pulse. I took off his helmet. I started feeling all around his face. I don't, for some reason, I had it in mind, maybe somebody cut his throat the way he looked. I've seen people with their throats cut, with their eyes just wide open. I felt all around his neck, the back of his neck, the front of his neck. I wasn't feeling any blood. I felt all inside his flank jacket, his chest, around his back. I was frisking him, you know, like a cop would frisk somebody. I frisked him thoroughly. I felt, I mean, I was moving him. He's not saying a word. He's not making a sound. Morning came. And I took this guy. I had him lay this guy on his back with like a pack or something under his head. I don't know what it was, but he had something under his head like a pillow, just laid out, on downside. I had the Corman come. He was in the third house behind us. Not the next house, but the one behind that. I had the Corman come over and look at him. And he'd never seen anything on 
some kids, some maybe corner, that's another corner. He's never seen anything like it. And he said, Charge, he said, his, his, his mind's not there. I said, Doc, what's wrong with him? He said, I think he's got some kind of mental problem. He said, I don't see anything physical. He said, it's like his mind has gone somewhere else. And he's as helpless as a newborn baby. He said, Doge, we got to get him out of here. I said, no shit. Because he's not only does the compassion come out of you as the leader of this group of men, because you're responsible for this guy. And this guy is worse than helpless. I mean, he's worse than helpless. He left up to his own devices. He's just going to stay there and die. And when you sent me that picture, but that's not a while ago, that's been several months ago. I've had dreams about it, I've tried to replay it in my mind. And what I've just given you is my best recollection of what happened. But that picture that you sent me, remember I only spent like an hour, 45 minutes or an hour with a guy in the daylight. But I'm telling you, that's the guy. That's the guy. So, well, what was his name? <laughs> <laughs> what was his name, Asian boy? The problem was that the uh, rate of casualties was so uh, cyclonic that, I mean, they, they didn't know who they were going into. into that each day's fight. Cajun Bob had turned up with 12 guys. Nine had been killed and wounded within 24 hours. Uh, he was fresh to the company anyway. So he was just being fed sort of piecemeal units from, from others which had been gathered together. Elsewhere, he said, look, I, by, by the end of it all, I knew about two guys I had. The rest were just being gathered from bits of other battalions and sent to me. So he said, I'd, he gave me a couple of names that he thought it might be that it might have begun with a W or an M, but he um, he was absolutely certain that that was the Marine that he found. It tied in exactly with what happened next. He described having evacuated by two guys to the company CP, which is command post, which is where Myron Harrington also saw the shell shot Marine, where a couple of other people described this. Quite tall, good looking guy, shambling, mute, uh, and but nobody knows who he is. Now, some things which you stare at enough, you stare at the image enough, and he's looking at us always from this wall here as well as up there. There are some things about him. He's, he's, um, he's clearly been in a lot of combat. He's not some guy who just got off the helicopter that day. He looks that the unit by that stage, by the 21st, has been in Kuwait for a week. And I'd say he's been in there that week. He's unshaven, he's dirty, his uniforms, ragged, he's, he's been fighting. He's got the suggestion of tattoos on his left knuckle. Might suggest he's Hispanic, might not. He's got a pen in the left, top left-hand pocket uh, of his combat jacket. Probably an NCO. You wouldn't have bother having a pen as a grub. Um, and he's got his watch. And I've had experts look at the graffiti on his helmet. We can't pick anything up. But. All the Marines I spoke to suggested that he was a veteran of Operation Swift, which was the previous year where Delta Company got their name Dying Delta because they got wham then too. Uh, and although Dawn describes them as quite judgmental of him in that command post where he was, and certainly 50 years later, nobody was that judgmental of him. They're like, hey, it could have been me. Then you, um, I mean, you had you had an intermediary who was who was talking to the marine, the next marine, marine veteran. Yeah. Then so I, I thought I uh, at one point I thought I got a, a big a big break. Uh, I had a researcher who was helping me with the archives in in uh, Washington D.C. and. Through a process of elimination, there were two or three people I became particularly interested in. And one of them had the sort of uh, trace in his documents um, 
which suggested he might well be this man. This particular individual had um, was a seasoned veteran, was in prison, put in jail twice for going AWOL, was in jail at the start of the Tet Offensive in the Battle of Fort Way, had been taken out of jail and sent straight to join his unit, which was Delta Company. And he was evacuated that day, the 21st. It was very unclear as to what he, he had some sort of physical wound, but it was very mild. And he got sent off to a uh, psych unit in Cambrai or somewhere uh, in Vietnam. And he remained there for three weeks. It was quite uncommon. Uh, it was common if you were if you were lightly wounded to be treated there and go back to your unit. You were seriously wounded to leave the country. But he didn't either. He didn't go back to his unit. He was, went to some sort of psychiatric unit for a while and then went back to the States. And I found him with great difficulty. I found, um, I found a state that I believed he lived in. I couldn't trace him through the white pages. Then I found that his wife had died about 10 years ago, and I went into her online funeral page and saw that someone had left a message there, a lady with a very unusual foreign sounding name. So then I put that foreign sounding name through the traces, the white pages in the state got name and address of the lady who I then approached, I cold called her. And she was pretty cool, pretty intelligent, so yeah, look, I know, I know this guy. I don't know if he's the man in the photograph, but I know him, and I knew his, his uh, wife who died. And um, I can, if you write a letter, I will get the letter to him and see if he can help you out. And I was due to cross into Syria, and I'm having these conversations over the period of the night quite distracted because I'm going to go into Syria with this lady uh, in a southern state um, about the shell shock wound. <coughs> so I, I wrote this draft of this letter from the Iraqi Syrian border and came in a very blue way. You know, you'd say, look, hey, you should, is this you? Are you the shell shock marine? You say, uh, I would really appreciate any advice or help you could give me. My name is bloody blah, I'm an English journalist, da, 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 da. I'm trying to identify marines who were photographed by the British photographer Storm McCullen in the Battle of Way 50 years ago, da -de -da -de -da. and I've spoken to some others, and it may be that you can help me identify some guys in these photographs, and uh, this guy. Anyway, she duly handed, I disappeared, I sent it to her, sent the letter to her, and photographed to her, I went into Syria and I came out and I hadn't heard back from her and I was desperate to hear back from her. So I contacted her and she just said that was awful. I sat down in the cafe, I was talking to him and said, by the way, I've heard from a British journalist. He wanted me to give you this letter and photograph. He took one look at the letter, then saw the photograph, became distraught, got up out of the cafe and left. And she just said, I can't, I can't go about that with him. So I was like, listen, don't. About it, it? I felt very unwilling. It, it wasn't. It wasn't definite. It was him. There were a lot of matches. I could have been more predatory about it. But then, to, to what end? I framed the letter in the most gentle, open terms I could. And to then pursue the guy more aggressively than that would have been totally wrong. So I left it there. Maybe that was him, maybe it wasn't. He, remain, he remains a good mystery. He remains a good mystery. But the other mystery, uh, which you solved, is, um, is the wounded or dead, actually. This is, the, uh, this was, the, on, on the tank. There's always, you know, you always end up in a different space in journalism from one you uh, think you're going to. Or as you might, there's a file there called Blame. Um, and uh, the first photograph, I'm hoping, is of a wounded Marine or a tank. <coughs> cool. Yeah. So, that one. Let's try that one. Okay, I'll start with this photograph, actually. This is a very interesting photograph. Don described this in the video uh, earlier. This is a low white school building. It's been hit by a tank. Uh, this is a squad of Marines from uh, Charlie Company 15. On the left, there's a scrabble of two or three guys. Actually, they're two corpsmen. 
there's a uh, black corner you can just see when he's pack up, he's third from the left. And then there's a big, uh, you don't see him very well here, big fat white guy who's another corner, and they're working on a casualty who's a young man uh, who's just been shot. His helmet is away just in the foreground of that rubble. Um, they dragged him aside there. They're actually, the fire's not that heavy. They're sort of out of combat, uh, out of uh, line of fire now. But they're working on him against that wall. Do you mind showing the next photograph? <clears throat> okay. This is minutes later. This is the guy they're working on. Uh, the guy with the squid in his helmet you saw earlier in the film was uh, Richard Schlegel. Now, this young man, there's a few really important details to notice, not just his face, the incredible uh, nose and some symmetry of his eyebrows. Um, but also he's, wearing, he's got his trousers undone, he's uh, taken around in the chest, uh, actually just under his, his armpit, and it has gone through him, and you see it in other photographs on Don's uh, contact sheet, and come out the left lower side of his spine. Uh, and his platoon sergeant, this guy called John Erskine, said, I'm pretty sure he's dead already, but I, I don't want to panic the squad so much, so I shouted at the corner just put a drip in it anyway. Uh, interestingly, I found uh, the corpsman, one of the corpsmen is the Afro-American corpsman called Octavia Glass, who was an incredible witness. Dawn, by the way, was a great witness. Um, he could record in fantastic detail what had happened during the battle. Um, I guess because he's had to think about the photographs so much afterwards and talk about it so much. I found also with the corpsman, with the medics, they were great witnesses as well, particularly if they'd lost somebody, because they'd think about who they'd lost why they'd lost them, and if they could have done something else in their treatment for a long time afterwards. So Octavia Glass was, as I said, the black corpsman who had truly playing. He appears in earlier photographs. He remembered the incident so well. Not only did he know this Marine, his name's James Blaine, but he also recorded, recorded Dawn as having some sort of orange Minto sweets in his pocket, which he, <laughs> he gave to him. Um, which, he, it's, not, it's not something you get in a book, that. I mean, it's, it's, it absolutely was great reason. Anyway. James Blaine died. He was either already dead, they put him on a board, put him on the tank, either already dead by the time they put him on the tank, or, or died then. Richard Schlegel said that was ne he never felt any, any life. But, here's the thing. Do you mind flicking up to the next photograph? If you remember those, those three guys, um, sorry, tank, yeah, let's tank, let's see how that is. So that photograph, okay, so minutes later, an American photographer called John Olson, takes the same tank. By this time, other wounded have been put aboard it. And it actually becomes a better known figure. It's like the raft of Medusa. I mean, it's a better known picture. It's like the raft of Medusa. Um, and so, very strong photo. What's happened since then, and this is quite awkward, and an awkward moment which you'll uh, appreciate. About a year ago, I wrote to Mark Bowden, the author of uh, Black Hawk Down, amongst many other books, uh, who I knew was finalising his work on his book, Way 1968. And I wanted to check a couple of research points with Mark. He replied uh, with great grace and, and, and professionalism and, and uh, clarified a couple of things. My research on Don's photos continued. In passing, I was focusing on the shell shock marine, but I was confident that I'd already identified this guy as James Blaine, and the guy holding him as Richard Schlegel because there are a lot of reports out there that testify against those two and I was already in touch with Richard Schlegel. Then Mark Bowden's book comes out and it says, hang on, wait a minute, this photograph, which is taken by John Olson, shows a Marine who's very much alive, uh, Alvin Grantham. He was uh, shot through the chest on the 17th of May. James Blaine had been shot and died on the 15th of May. Uh, Alvin Grantham shot in the chest on the 17th of uh, February, should I say. Um, he was zipped up in a body bag, started twitching, was uh, recovered, brought back to life, lived, had seven kids and many, many grandchildren. Hallelujah, America loves it. Wham, he's on the talk shows, you know, the book's away, and it's a fantastic story. And also, in fairness, Alvin Grantham is a really respected Marine, a very brave guy. He was absolutely shot in the chest. He was absolutely evacuated in the tank, zipped up in a body bag, but that's not him in the photograph. Now, here's the thing. I've spoken or tracked every guy on this tank. The guy at the very back, 
his helmet, you can just see that. It's a guy called Corporal Leon Clifford Dodge, so I spoke to. What's unclear from that picture, he just taken, he was the commander of the 106 crew, it's like a big recoilless rifle. Uh, and these, him and the other two in front of him are his guys from the same crew. What it doesn't show, he's just taken a piece of shrapnel that's gone to his eye, they bandaged it, but because he's a good NCO and wants to oversee, it's obscured his other eye, oversee what's going on, he's taken the bandage off uh, and actually loses his, his eye. Uh, the guy in front of him is a guy called Dennis Omer, who'd been wounded in the leg, and that's very fresh blood on that leg there. You can't see his face, it's obscured, but that's him. Dennis died a couple of years ago. That's uh, Jim Rice in the middle, who'd been hit by two mortar blasts. His face is all messed up and his arms messed up. He now runs a roofing business uh, up in uh, North Carolina, and I spoke with him. Richie Schlegel, I spoke with him and continued to at length. Interesting guy in the far left, James Beals. James died a couple of years ago, but I spoke to his nephew. Now, the wound record dates, but those three guys at the back all say the 15th of February, which is the day James Blaine was shot and killed. Beals over at the left in 1985 wrote about this incident. He said, I was just the escort on the tank taking the wounded out. He was a Marine too. But I was wounded three days later on the 18th which also places the date this photograph was taken there for the 15th. And I've checked out his documentation as well, and that matches. Richie Schlegel, though, and this is one to have a mess of documentation, he says, I'm holding James Blaine, and it's the 15th of February, and Blaine died of my arms. But his wound documentation says it was the 17th of February. So you've got conflicting documents, guys in the same photograph. In fairness, Mark Bowen's not here, and he has his own own thoughts as to why that's not James Blaine. But I've gone through three lines of evidence gathering here. The testimony of the platoon <coughs> sergeant, six other guys from this platoon, and they all say it's James Blaine, including the corpsman, who gives the most graphic account of bandaging a man he knew, James Blaine, put him on that tank. Then I've gone through all the documentation, which is ball breaking because it's it's a pain in the arse, I've gone through all that. The overwhelming mass of documentation also says it's Blaine. And then I've had access to Dawn's uh, as yet mostly unpublished contact sheets of the preceding minutes to that instant, which show, to my mind, absolutely decisively that it's James Blaine. Grantham had a very different wound. It went to his chest, it came out of his shoulder blade. Dawn's contact sheets, you see what killed this guy, it's gone in there, it's blown out the back of his thigh. Um, however, I start then writing to Mark, having originally contacted him saying, hey, can you help me clarify a few things? I'm reading a fantastic review on his book, Quake 68, it's a great book. But then I'm going like, hey Mark, there's one issue I've got. I think you've got the wrong guy on the tank, because I think it's some, someone else. And uh, at first he's very, very open about it, and I think remains open about it, but um, we ended up in quite a big disagreement. Him, John Olson took the photograph and Albert Grantham. And we'll see where that goes, but what I found was I accrued this huge mass of evidence, really tight, that it was plain. But I did that six months after the publication of the big book, by which time Grantham was on talk shows. You know, Hollywood was interested. And there wasn't a whole lot of appetite for the cactus sandwich which the English <laughs> journalist was coming up with saying, Guy. But more to the point, I think this also wasn't the issue of context and cultural context and cultural trauma, which I was talking about early, earlier. I think America remains deeply uh, traumatized as a country by what happened in Vietnam and then what happened again in Iraq and what is happening again in Afghanistan now. And what, what do you want as a story of a battle and a war you lost and which was ultimately futile? Do you want the story of the guy at the center of one of the most iconic images of the war? who actually cheated the Reaper, survived, had seven kids, and loads of grandchildren as some sort of pinnacle of, Jesus, somebody made it. Or do you want the story of, hang on, it's James Blaine from Spokane. Did he ever see the sunset or love a woman? No, he was dead by the time they put him on a tank. That's what I'm stuck with. I read, uh, I read a piece of Martha Griffin over there. Yeah. 
Leave your mind. <laughs> and, and interestingly, I'd gone out looking for that guy. That consumed way and above more energy and time out there. Uh, and particularly, it doesn't ultimately matter to me what, what about all the others think. I go with the guys from, from Charlie Company, and they, all of them, to a man, said, hey, it's a fuck up, it's James Blake. You know, it's one of our guys. He died. We were there. Hey, you know what? It is really important, and this is what this is why I think because there is an argument like, hey, leave it, just leave it. It's 50 years old, right? You, what do you want to do? Steal the glory from a, a, a decorated marine veteran who actually survived, who who thinks he, he's the subject? Just leave it now. But I don't think that's true. Here, here's why. There's very little that any of us in the room know about each other. There's very little fact we really know and ourselves, perhaps, there are two bookends which we can really define. When we're born and when, we're, when we die. And in the era when, you know, our basic foundation of communicating with each other, which is fact and truth, is under a huge amount of question anyway, which is why everything's getting so discombobulated and frantic because we seem to be losing our ability to deal with fact, then I absolutely think that this is not some cliched fog of war moment. I mean, fog of war does exist, but it's also a sort of convenient sort of bullshit cliche for people's inability to really nail down information, right? Now, this guy is not lost to the fog of war. <coughs> Dawn has 30 photographs of him preceding those moments. The documentation exists for all these men and their identities and which date it is on. Even if the documentation is slightly contradictory, that you don't cross that, match that with testimonial. This is not some guy who, who, whose identity has been lost. So I think it's a really big deal. I think it's the sort of misplacing of a, of a young man's soul. Yeah, 18 years old. 18 years so old. And I don't think you screw around with that sort of detail. But that's why I feel yeah, strongly. strongly about it. But as you say, um, the Bowen version, Alvin Grant's version, <coughs> suits the American narrative. So I can see how it, I can see how it came about. Um, I can see how it came about, and the, it started with John Olson, the photographer who took that image. who had been approached by several. Incidentally, it's quite odd. The Marines all came back from from Vietnam in '68, got spat at and isolated. God, you go to America now, everybody's claiming to fought in Vietnam. We don't know whether they're in the army or not. I respect Richie Schlegel. Richie Schlegel holding the uh, holding James Blake out screaming his helmet. He said he's had dozens of people across the years saying, "Hey, I was the Marine. You're holding on the tank." And he said he's had so many he doesn't bother even contradicting. He's just like, "So he made it." <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, yeah, there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of people wanting to be in that photograph, and it's no doubt with Alvin Grantham who's thinks it's him. I mean, he's the real deal. He's a Marine. He was shot. He was evacuated on a tank. And he approached John Olsen and said, I think that's me. Um, he sort of looks a bit the same, but he doesn't look like James Blake. Uh, and I'm absolutely sure that is James Blake. Shall we throw it over to questions? Uh, sure. Yeah, he does. I'm in touch. He, uh, his parents are dead, uh, his dad was a vet, and uh, his three siblings, two sisters, brother. <coughs> when you approached them, how did they react to that? They were fat. They said something really sweet and really humble. They said, look, the picture came out. Very great. No, they knew. They were really antagonized about this, the book thing. They were like, hang on, that's not bother us. Now someone else said it. And I've been in a room with Richard Schlegel and Alvin Grantham, who thinks he's the guy who Richard Schlegel's on. You wouldn't think they would speak. They don't speak at all. They don't say that. Uh, that's because, I'm absolutely sure it's not those those two, and Richard doesn't think it's <coughs> Alvin Grantham. Um, a lot of the Marines are grateful that an issue had been picked up which they wanted to address. The problem is the momentum of the narrative which is built up. No, uh, it's very difficult um, to turn that around, but not, in, not impossible. Um, not impossible, perhaps. We'll see. So, 
That was really fascinating, thank you. I'm slightly surprised to find myself at the end of this session feeling, looking at that image that's been hovering over us all evening, a sense of relief so that more. you didn't find. Thank God. Because, mm. because the iconic power of that image that transcends the moment which was taken and the circumstances which was taken relies to some extent on our ignorance and our ability to read into it what we will. And I wonder how you feel about not finding this person and whether there's an advantage sometimes to not know the circumstances. Uh, in this case, uh, I felt relieved not to find it. I had gone all the way I could and the most awkward meeting was, was the one actually when I was in another country on the Syrian Syria Iraqi border with this woman going to see a guy who I, was my real prime person of, of interest here. And once that had gone, I still thought by seeing all the other Marines something might come up. Um, and I was really pleased, I have no doubt, that Cajun Bob is describing that guy. It's just so, you know, that's the guy, that's the guy. It's so detailed. And talk about memory, 50 years on, he's saying, yeah, the corpsman came not from the house on the left, but from the one behind that. You know, it's like really razor sharp and on it. Um, I found circumstances where he was discovered got the trail of him from that house to the CP the next morning, you saw him there, and I followed it up with everybody I can, and uh, yeah, I was kind of relieved, lots of fun. And, and I found out as much as I could about him. I really tried to find him, but I've got a couple of very predatory uh, people said, uh, yeah, just doorstep him, we'll go to the cafe. I was like, you kidding, you know, what? I hope no one else finds me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Anthony, I've got a follow-up question about the uh, kind of iconic value of the photographs. Um, do you think that if the Vietnam War was fought in the internet age, that these photographs would have lost some of their iconic power? Because um, in the internet age, everything is photographed, so therefore you would have had to have had this journey to find the Marine that you would have known straight away, and therefore that the photographs are only powerful because the Vietnam War was not fought in the internet age? Uh, I think that's very true. I think now uh, photographs from, you know, quite a few Americans in, in Iraq or Afghanistan, you almost always, if not find out who they are immediately, then trace it down very, very quickly through, you know, the unit <coughs> Facebook page or, or whatever. Um, and <coughs> it fascinated me. <coughs> finding these guys from a time before the internet age who were in touch not with themselves, not with media sort of stratas of, of photographs. The guy, he's the thoughtful marine, uh, he made a comment in the, in the uh, little film about uh, seeing Don and, and wondering why Don didn't have any weapons or something like that. He first saw that photograph in, I think it was 1996. And it wasn't even the original photograph he saw. Someone had torn out the photograph from a magazine, sent it to his dad, saying, I think this is your son, Joel. The dad looked at it, thought, shit, it's Joel. The dad was an artist, so he quickly painted an art a painting of Joel from Don's picture. Then he's like, I like that oil. So he threw Don's picture away and said to Joel, come and see the picture I've done of you. So Joel's first viewing of Don's picture was actually even oil his father had painted of Don's picture. Um, and it was therefore, it was very fresh with them. Dr. the war with the photographs. Uh, and I agree, the, the value, the mystery, the iconic status was all um, enhanced by the fact that, um, yeah, they weren't known. Alistair. <coughs> Uh, given that the, at the beginning of the project it was about finding um, who was uh, the shell shock marine, once you'd done all the interviews and met all of the guys, can you tell us a little bit about the process of building the narrative um, that became your article? Uh, yeah, it was quite. I had, I've got quite a generous cap. I think I've got about five thousand words. Um, so there was a logic. Obviously, you want to start with the image and thinking. Many or most readers will know this image. So start there, and then set the Battle of Quay, which is an interesting battle, and this pinnacle of sort of violence in Vietnam, and put Don there. 
And then I found that each of how many did I find? Seven or eight plus one, one identified as dead. Each of them brought something to me, whether it was the echoes of trauma all down through the generations, as in the case state of a uh, case of Selwyn Tate. Whether it was Melvin Bourgeois, who was the most incredibly articulate marine, this mellifluous, beautiful draw, who describes, I didn't use it all here, oh my god, the moments before he was shot, is photographed in this crucifixion pose. He's going along the wall and there's a Vietnamese, North Vietnamese army soldier in a foxhole that's been sniping at, at the guys and, and get hitting some of them, some of the marines. So Melvin, he's 18, and, but he's quite, you know, it's quite a hoo-ha marine. He's going along and he's like, I've got a grenade and I'm going to take these guys. And there's not much room to, to, to move because the wall's right up there and you've got about 20 feet. Uh, and he's closing with the guy in the foxhole. So he says to his squad, just find him, okay, right, give me some covering fire. And I go in and I pop him with a grenade. And whatever you do, don't fucking shoot me, right? Because that's what often happens. And so he's crawls along and he keeps losing. Okay, right, he's under that bit of corrugated down there. So he pulls the pin. And just as he throws it, the Vietnamese guy shoots him through the groin. But it comes out of his arse, and the pain in his buttock is so much worse than the pain in his groin that he thinks the guy's behind him shot. <laughs> so he falls in <laughs> He says, he said, you motherfuckers, you shot me in the arse. I told you not to do that. <laughs> no, he wasn't arse. <laughs> 